okay, so you're at these concerts and they always try to play this really cool music, you know, before the band. And all this stuff is going on. It's, it's dark and everyone goes crazy. I mean, I don't care how many times I was on stage, I was frozen with anxiety and nervousness. And you're thinking, my arms are not even going to work right now. And then all of a sudden, you know, click, click, click. Just in the first three seconds of playing, it's all that practice. You're not even thinking about the music. You are, you're, you're becoming one as a band and you are just, you're just giving everything. Hi, my name is Mario Minardi and this is my story. The hit song from General Public was down, 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 down. Where's all the tenderness? So on the East Coast, we played Madison Square Garden, and uh, th that was just a dream come true for me to play such a great place. So I'm 22 years old, and all of a sudden I I've gone from an undiscovered nobody to a guy who's in a, a, a world-famous band. It was the kind of thing where all of a sudden people idolize you, and it really goes to your head. You know, we don't really know who you are, but we love you. Wow, I mean, back then I loved it. It was great meeting girls in different cities. It became really empty. It uh, became empty in, in, in a short amount of time. Well, after we had recorded the album and did some uh, videos for MTV in England, all the touring was done in America. General Public was way more popular here than in their home country of Great Britain. So we traveled, we toured, and there was kind of a rift between the lead singer and myself. We just weren't getting along and I developed a really bad attitude. We got to Philadelphia and we played a gig there and they told me, um, hey, you know what? This, this is not working out. And I was just, I was devastated. To kind of go from being a rock star to living at mom and dad's house again. <laughs> there's no girls, there's no crowds, there's no nerves, there's no highs, there's no lows, there's no tension. There is just you. There is just you. When I wasn't performing, I, I didn't feel good. I, I didn't, that sense of feeling good, forget about feeling like you're worth something. It was just like even a sense of well-being. It was kind of one of those rock bottom times. You know, I'm not strung out on cocaine. I'm not, you know, stealing money from banks. I'm not a drunk in the streets, but I was just as empty. I was empty in my own way. That was a time where I started literally looking up and saying, God, are you for real? If you're real, I need to know because I've experienced a lot of stuff and it didn't do for me what I thought it was gonna do. Pain was a way that, that God really um, got my attention. When things were great, uh, who, needs, who needs anybody? Who needs God? I was asking, I think, a, a good question, but it was an honest question. God, are, are you real? And if you're real, please let me know. I shot up that prayer so many times and it just felt disingenuous that that I, I knew by this time that, that music was a god in my life. It, not the art part of music, but what music did for me and what it got me. I kind of did the unthinkable, at least at the time it felt like it, but I gave up music. I'd gotten so much of my identity from music that I, I, I was open and I was ready for God to be real. I just felt like, I think if there's a God, there can only be one God. And so I gotta give the God of the Bible a, a real chance to to be God. Okay, so if I'm gonna give music up vocationally, what am I gonna do? I, I, I gotta live, I gotta eat. And the, the most honest thing that was inside of me was to be around kids. And so I went back to school to get my teaching credential and I became a high school teacher. Around this time, I met a girl who I could spend the rest of my life with. So on July 3rd, 1993, uh, I was standing uh, on a different kind of stage. I was standing at, on a stage at a church and I'm looking down the aisle and just watching my beautiful wife-to-be uh, approaching me. And I was just, I was so flooded with emotions. Uh, emotions, I, again, looking back, God, I, I, I asked for you to be real. And all the realness of God, all the goodness of God, if this is what it's like to follow God, it's the most fulfilling and right-feeling thing that I have ever felt. 
So I've been married for about six days at this time, and I was on my way to uh, to teaching summer school, approaching the same light that I had done hundreds of times before, and real typical, uh, the light's turning yellow, and right when, you, right when you get up to the light, it turns red, and I kind of looked over my shoulder, and no one was coming. And as I looked back to make the right turn, there was a body on my windshield. It was full on denial. I just got married six days ago. There's no way that I, you know, I, I hit someone and an hour later they're dead. And there's a police officer that, that came and you know, I just remember him. So what color was the light when you passed through the light? And that, that's where it's like, oh my gosh, I, uh, uh, I was scared to death. And so there was no witnesses and I said, oh, the, the light was yellow. I mean, I totally lied to this guy. You know, in our men's group at church, just that week prior to my wedding, we were studying Psalm 15. And Psalm 15 talks about, it poses the question, Lord, who may, who may be in your presence? Who may ascend your holy mountain? Uh, and then, then it says, the answer to that is, he who speaks the truth from his heart, and who, later on it says, he who keeps his oath, even when it hurts. And I just thought, I mean, God, you have been so good to me and you have answered all of my prayers and you are so real to me. And now, you know, the first real difficult thing happens in my life. And the first thing I do is lie because I'm afraid. And I remember right when my wife showed up, um, I was in this room by myself and she comes in and she just, she was crying and she asked if I was okay. And I just looked at my wife and I said, I lied about what color the light was and I need to tell the truth. The light was red and she totally supported me. I called the sergeant back into the room, had my Bible on this little table and I said, sir, um, I I'm a Christian and, but I'm really normal and I, and I was afraid and when the officer asked me what color the light was, I lied and the light was red. He just said, this changes everything. Once we got through all the court proceedings, I had done 300 community service hours at an Alcoholics Anonymous place, cleaning toilets and, and mopping floors, being on probation for a few years. I just felt like there wasn't closure. And so something that was really important to me was some way to get in touch with the family. Uh, the lady that I hit and killed was 71 years old, and I knew that she had four children. I wrote her a letter addressed to all the children. Basically in this letter, I asked for forgiveness. A few months after I had sent my letter, um, I got this card in the mail, and the contents of this card, um, it, it, not only was it a surprise to hear these words, but it was one of the most tangible expressions um, of God's grace and mercy that, that I had ever experienced in my life. Mario and Cheryl, thank you for your letter. I know it was hard to write, as is this one. Yes, we miss our mother very much, and I know we always will but in no way do we blame you. Yes, we ask the Lord why, but no, as our Heavenly Father, He loves us and we are His children. Mario, I can't take away your pain nor the experience, but I can assure you without a shadow of a doubt that the first person you see in, you see in heaven will be my mom running to you with outstretched arms saying, it's okay, I'm okay. I'm sorry you had to go through it all, but live your lives, have children, be God-fearing parents, and make this world a better place for all of us. One of mother's favorite sayings was, God's gift to me is life. What I do with that life is my gift to him. He has that gift now. You too, use your lives as a gift and look for my mom to greet you. I too have prayed for you to have peace this last year. Patricia for Mark, David, and Ed. This tragedy, he made a lot of things beautiful through this. He taught me about grace. He taught me about being a truth teller. And, and he taught me that my superstitions of him, uh, this payback for what I had done in my previous life, I was so wrong that God used this to redeem my whole past. <laughs> and uh, God is so much bigger than I thought. And, and, and today, uh, I, you know, I, that, that card that I read from that lady was in December 1994. Uh, in the beginning of 1998, I entered into full-time Christian ministry. As a music guy connecting people with God, the, the very 
desire that God planted in my heart. And I know that a lot of this foundation work was built in these years of, of crying out to God, of hardship, of telling the truth, of, of keeping my promises to God, even when those promises cost me something.